Investor intelligence provides general information only. You should consider seeking independent advice to see how this information relates to your unique circumstances. Please refer to the terms and conditions available at investorintelligence.com.au for more. Welcome to this week's episode of Investor Intelligence, your weekly podcast on all things investment, hosted by me, Jacob Kearns. Welcome everyone. Today I have a very exciting guest with me. He is the Business Development Manager at Flat Planet, an offshore recruitment staffing agency that help busy professionals and he is also the host of the Future of Australia podcast. Welcome Derek. Thanks for having me Jacob. So tell us a little bit about your background and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, so I, um, I lost 35 kilos in 12 months when I was in year 12, oh, wow. got really into health and fitness. So I was uh, yeah. studying a commerce degree, I ran a fitness business and really enjoyed business. But I thought, oh yeah, graduate, get a big uh, accounting firm, grad job and everything will be smooth sailing for the next two decades. But six months in, I sort of hated it and wanted something different that wasn't a, a big Melbourne uh, accounting firm job. So I pulled the plug and said, I want to do something different. I co-majored in accounting and marketing. So I thought, why not get a marketing internship? And live overseas, so that was the goal, get a job overseas. And yeah, Manila came up on my radar as a place that was different. It was a lot of Australian entrepreneurs starting companies and doing things over there. So I bought a one-way ticket, packed a bag and took a job as a marketing intern in Manila. And that's where I sort of a decade ago fell into this outsourcing or offshore staffing industry in the Philippines. Lived in Manila for half a decade, came back 2018, spent a couple of years in cybersecurity, working with a lot of government, big corporate, and then last couple of years rejoined more from the, the Melbourne and client-facing side back in the offshore staffing or outsourcing industry. Yeah, okay, that sounds sounds exciting. What was it like living overseas? Yeah, I used to say to new expats who just arrived in Manila, I said, you'll have good days and bad days, but I promise you won't have any boring days. So yeah. it's sort of sometimes higher highs and lower lows. So it's yeah, a bit okay. of a you know chaotic living in a 25 million person city. It's very energetic and yeah. you know emerging. But yeah, I wanted an adventure and that's what I got. So yeah. yeah, I definitely found what I was looking for. We'll definitely go into your offshore recruitment agency in a minute, but I want to get into your podcast first because you do interview quite an impressive range of people. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so I've been a massive podcast listener for probably over a decade since before podcasts were super mainstream and Flat Planet, we're actually on the Fin Review Fast Starters and I thought this is great and a lot of our clients were, this was sort of 2015, 2016. But all the business podcasts I found at the time were very American, which is great, and you, you, know, you learn from all over the world, but I thought there's no one interviewing these fascinating Australian fast-growth entrepreneurial scale-ups. They get one day a year in the Fin Review, because again, the Fin Review is more focused on the, the big end of town, and I thought, well, again, I've met them, we're one of them, they've got great stories, I thought, well, why don't I start it? So late 2017, I started the podcast, about yeah, 75 episodes in, so that's 75 of the fastest-growing new businesses in Australia, directly interviewing the owners, CEOs, and founders about their journey. So it's the Australian Australian Financial Review that picked the 100 fast starters, and that's every year, isn't it? Yes, yeah, so each yeah. financial year. So now they're, they're taking entries for the uh, FY 2023. So based on top line revenue growth, there's one category, the ones I focus on are businesses that have been around less than five years. Then there's a fast 100 for businesses that have been around more than five years. Yeah. And they're, yeah, the fastest growing businesses in Australia. And it's across various industries. Yeah, I've seen all sorts. I've seen craft, gluten-free beer manufacturers, okay. yeah. staffing and recruitment companies. Again, a lot of Property is, is Australia, a big part of the economy is property. So a lot of property businesses, marketing and media agencies, law firms, e-commerce, direct to consumer. So a whole range of fascinating businesses, travel businesses that have you know grown and, and done really well. Who are some standouts that you've had on? Yeah, so there was one that really sticks in my mind because it changed my thinking. So, so a common story that came up in the early episodes with these entrepreneurs that would have an idea, they'd start a business, they'd get a couple of staff, and then things would really take off and they'd go from five staff to maybe 50 staff really quickly. Mm. And then everything would kind of crash and collapse in a sense. Not that business was bad, but their team dynamics would completely implode. And I would hear the story and would talk about it and, and I kept hearing it, kept hearing it. I thought, okay, that's interesting. There's something there. And then um, David Bowser, who's the founder of an education consultancy called Curio, he sort of clarified, which is why I remember that episode, he said there's a big difference between a broad generalist and a deep specialist. 
Yeah, okay. And he said, you know, when a company's five people, everyone kind of has to be a broad generalist. You yeah. might be doing sales meetings and you're fixing the website and you're sending invoices, right? Because there's only five of you, so you don't have departments and all that. But when you grow, and he went from, again, five staff to probably 75 staff in a year or two, very quickly you go from needing broad generalists who can wear five hats and do five different roles to deep specialists, someone who just does invoicing, someone who just does sales, someone who just runs a website. And he said, you'd think that's a good thing because you tell someone, hey, you don't have to worry about all these things. But he said, actually, counterintuitively, people who are attracted to a five-person business are often broad generalists or they mm-hmm. like being a broad generalist. So when you think you're rewarding them, saying, hey, you're now responsible for everything, you know, finance, you don't have to worry about all these other non-finance things, often they actually dislike that because you're taking away the variety that yeah. they like. Or if you put a deep specialist, Specialist in often things in a small team don't work because they say, Well, that's not on my job description. Yeah. May have come from big corporate, very, very specialist roles. And when a business grows slowly, people can adapt. But when a business grows very quickly, that speed of change meant that a lot of broad generalists often would leave and join other early stage companies where they felt it suited them best. Or, you know, so that clarification, again, I've kept that with me and the theme repeats because a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with this. But even friends applying for jobs, I always encourage them to ask themselves, are you a broad generalist or a deep specialist? And then what size business do you fit in best? Because that causes a lot of friction, I think, when people haven't thought, they think the industry, they think the company's exciting, they don't think, are they a broad generalist or a deep specialist? So that one has stuck out because it's impacted my thinking throughout sort of business and friends and career. Yeah. Can you tell whether someone is a broad generalist or a specialist based on talking to them? Are there questions you can ask? Yeah, I think, you know, you get a sense for if someone's willing, they like to go deep on one thing and really be an expert on that. Whereas other people, myself included, sometimes say, I have a short attention span or I like variety or, you know, some people complain that every day is different and it's chaotic and other people say, I love that every day is different. So mm-hmm. it's sort of, I think people have a natural inclination towards variety going really deep, like some people do, you know, 10 years of study and get a PhD. Yeah. Other people change roles, change careers a lot. Again, I've been in fitness, I've been in accounting, I've been in marketing, I've been in sales. Other people, that would stress them out, but I like that variety. Yeah. So I think, yeah, you get a sense once you're, you've met enough people or if they've complained about all the corporate bureaucracy versus other people might complain about small business and, you know, being asked to do a lot of different things that's not traditionally in the scope of a, you know, a, a larger business role. Did you have any other examples of any interviews that come to mind? Um, I think each has a unique story. So the other thing that I think maybe isn't always obvious is you see these, they're on the list because they're the most successful, fastest growing, but often it's their second, third or fourth business. Yeah. So it's really interesting I found or an interesting takeaway was that they don't all hit a home run the first yeah. time, almost never. It's almost they started a business when they were young, they might have had a business they sold, they might have had a business partner, it didn't work out, they tried again, maybe their business started as one idea and then completely changed. Even that education consultancy um, with David Bowser, who I mentioned, started as a software business for universities okay. so i think the theme and that what stands out is how often people would adjust try fail so to speak try again and how it was often sort of on the second third fourth attempt that things really you know when they're struggling they're not invited on podcasts they're not yeah. winning uh, fast growth awards but yeah. once they're successful you realize how many things preceded and led up to that success yeah and i'm guessing a lot of those sorts of people would have a big appetite for risk right being able to go out start something fail go start something again maybe fail again until they do hit that home run and have success i know there's a lot more to it than that you know you're learning along the way and you're always growing but i think you you would have to have a big appetite for that too yeah although it's funny some conceive risk quite differently i think than the average person so for some people having all of your income as a job dependent on a boss who maybe suddenly doesn't like you and fires you or having all your, your network or your skills in a very specific place, they see that as risky. Yeah. Whereas other people see starting a business not having guaranteed income in the early days as risky. Yeah. So there's definitely an appetite and you've got to sort of back yourself. And a lot of them self-finance the business. You know, they didn't raise venture capital necessarily. But I think other people, yeah, perceive risk as being stuck in a bad industry, being at the whims of a client or a boss who doesn't like you or, you mm. know, changing HR or anything else. They see the control of their own business is less risky than being at the mercy of someone else's business. Yeah, that's a really good point. What about routines, habits, that sort of thing? Have you learned anything about that, speaking to these people? Yes, so I mentioned the theme of it's often not their first rodeo, but another theme which I think a lot of people miss is there are no lone geniuses and no lone wolves. Almost all of the people I interviewed had at least a business partner. I think yeah, there's maybe okay. one in 20 who was a sole founder. Right. But even if they were a sole founder or the business partner wasn't as directly involved, they have very supportive spouses 
and partners, very supportive families, very yeah. supportive for early employees, maybe if they've worked with at a previous company who often they have employee share ownerships as well, so they're sort of minority owners. That necessity to have the support through the ups and downs, to have a spouse who understands, you know, a lot sold their primary house, maybe to fund the business and over time they've built it back up or they, again, quit jobs, a lot of them move from overseas or maybe, again, quit a really good job. So no one does that in a vacuum. They yeah. do it with a support system. So you can get obsessed about people's 5 a.m. wake-up routines, but the real yeah. sort of meta theme I saw was a support network, someone they can lean on, bounce ideas off, or whether it's maybe advisors, you know, if not a business partner or a spouse or a partner, a life partner. And that fact that they exist in a team and it's a team sport, it's not a lone genius in the woods by themselves, you know, inventing a multi-million dollar business. It's someone with a very robust and understanding support network. That's an interesting perspective because often you do see that one person alone and you sort of put them on a pedestal in a way because you don't really see the support network and the wives and everything around them but you're 100% right a lot of people like that wouldn't do it alone and your team and everyone around you plays a big part in that. In regards to the actual person themselves is there any commonalities that you've seen in terms of perspective, work ethic, anything like that that contributes to their success? Well, another interesting trend I noticed was about 90% of them, probably 80-90%, actually didn't grow up in Australia. Oh, wow, okay. And I've had different ideas about why is that a lot, you know, expats who came to Australia, some as a teenager, some as an adult, and I wonder, is it, you know, maybe sometimes hard to break into certain industries and and the professional ranks if you come here as an adult and you didn't go through the Australian school system, university system, you haven't got those networks, so you're more inclined to start your own business. Yeah. Other, some, you know, British, American, European culture, sometimes more entrepreneurial, or the people, is it something, you know, like even myself, when I moved overseas, naturally people who move overseas have a different maybe mindset and risk profile and someone who grows up and lives in there because they grew up there and takes a job because that's what their friends did versus someone maybe who left for a purpose, specifically Mm. went overseas for a purpose and or maybe just have a very different perspective and see opportunities differently because they filter it through a lens of wherever they grew up versus being a a sort of uh, someone who grew up in Australia. So that's an interesting trend that I haven't figured out the why, but but it's a, a an obvious trend that you um that I see on the the Pearl interview. Yeah, you're forced and to get out there yeah. and network and meet people and yeah. yeah, you're less beholden to maybe whatever your circumstances were. If your parents yeah. were doctors, and you say, "Well, I better be a doctor." Whereas if your parents are doctors, but they're at home in in London or New York, and then you come here, well, there's maybe less familial and, and sort of community pressure, and there's more of a blank slate. Yeah. So yeah, still sort of open to ideas on why that is, but yeah, just something I've noticed with a, a lot of the, the people I've interviewed. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, incredible podcast. I've started listening. We'll include a link to that in the show notes. Anyone who's interested in hearing the stories, Future of Australia podcast, you know, they are young businesses, less than five years old, but some have become household names, had very big exits, like uh, Luxury Escapes, which was yeah, okay. uh, one of the fastest growing businesses so Adam Schwab has become very prolific and uh, I think he just opened up a physical presence in Chadson so there's businesses like that. Uh, Modi Body which was a direct to consumer feminine sort of product business that she invented. I think she sold it for several hundred million dollars to a big consumer packaged good holding company and got retail distribution so it's fascinating to hear and obviously I'm trying to catch them a bit earlier or Beef It Food who was on Shark Tank and has sort of again massive distribution that the pre-prepared sort of diet meal space so yeah. it's interesting I think to even listen back to some of the episodes from a few years ago and hear some yeah. of these people before they they were really really big and, and hear some of the incredible things that they achieved so yeah just encourage anyone who's interested in entrepreneurship to yeah have a listen and have you kept in contact with any of those people? Kept them in your network or had yeah. anyone back on? Yeah, no. Was, um, I generally try not to repeat guests. So I sort of use a, a fresh list or if someone's on the list multiple years in a row, I sort of try and just have them on once. But, but yeah, no, I've definitely stayed in contact with a lot of them and spread out all over Australia. But yeah, there's, um, you know, connected on, on LinkedIn and send them emails and connect if there's something I think that would be a good fit for them or yeah. another opportunity to sort of work together. Yeah, I've stayed in touch with quite a few actually and met mm. up with them. Yeah, that's awesome. Here at The Property Mentors, we have decades of experience investing in property. We know what to look for and what kind of impact it can have on your portfolio. We have access to brokers, accountants, and property managers to make sure your portfolio performs. Visit thepropertymentors.com.au to learn more. 
So tell me a bit more about Flat Planet and what capacity you work with businesses and um, how exactly you employ virtual assistants to alleviate some of the time, I guess you could say, for those professionals. Yeah, so Flat Planet, we're a family business founded by Chris Moriarty and his wife Jenny Moriarty, two Aussies who moved overseas to the Philippines about 13 years ago in 2010 and packed up their life and moved over there to start the business. I met Chris when I was already living over there and working at the first company. So yeah, we have about 400 staff in the Philippines, half a dozen staff in Australia, including myself in client-facing roles. We custom recruit, manage, and help integrate high-performance, skilled Filipino professionals into often mid-market growth entrepreneurial, family-run, sort of medium-sized Australian companies yeah. to help support their ongoing growth and access talent in Southeast Asia. We're also in Malaysia and Vietnam, but Philippines is the main spot and where we started to, yeah, keep growing, keep expanding and access a pool of talent that wouldn't otherwise be available. And how does that integration look when you're working with business? Do they become a part of your team? Or- yes, they literally embed directly into the client's organisation. So we employ them in, in the Philippines so they get properly employed with health insurance and weekly salary and provide the office and the IT and the sort of HR piece and staff activities, but they're on the client's email domain, their CRM, their communication systems like Slack or Zoom or Google Meets, any other sort of software like Zero. they're directly plugged into those things. They, they join the, the clients if they've got daily or weekly huddles. You know, sometimes when there's a, a quarterly staff lunch in, in Australia, we buy the team lunch in Manila, so they're all sort of celebrating together. We celebrate birthdays, anniversaries. They directly have a one-to-one line of communication yeah. and wear that wraparound support in Australia and in Manila. So again, the, the business owner in Australia doesn't have to worry about payroll and IT and office space and HR and other things. That person is, yeah, directly an extension of their Australian team. And that's how we, we connect. And how might that be better than someone just hiring in their own team? Within the country? Yeah. Yeah, so, so it's really access to talent. You know, 10 yeah. years ago when I sort of started in outsourcing, it was more what people used to call at the time a labour arbitrage, so saving money on wages. The landscape has evolved a lot in the last 10 years, especially with COVID and other changes mm-hmm. and technology. So now fewer people come to us saying, hey, I just want to save some money. There is still a cost saving that's, you know, a benefit, but really people say, you know, it's 3% unemployment in Australia. I'm struggling to find people. I've lost key Roles, I'm struggling to backfill. I'm growing people that are the bottleneck in the business. If I can't get the people on board, I'm turning away work. I'm, I'm losing expansion opportunities. I can't find the skills that I need. So it's really a skill shortage, a, a staff shortage, a gap that they're seeing a lot more than just people saying, well, how do I you know, move something from A to B to save a certain amount of money? Yeah, yeah. So when you're hiring a virtual assistant, what we cover a lot here, when you invest money, you're investing in an asset that will give you a cash return. But in outsourcing like this, you're essentially investing money to not get cash, but get time back. Would you agree with that? Yeah, there's an American guy, uh, Navar Ravikant, who um, is a really interesting thinker and entrepreneur, and he mentions the four main types of leverage in life and business, a code, capital, content and people. Yeah. So code is like software, you know, you use software to, to do things better. Capital, like you said, especially investing in real estate, you're investing capital, you're able to leverage it, you're able to multiply, you know, have multiple, you know, scale what you're doing or your assets. Content is, you know, media, like what we're doing, the podcast, so we yeah. record it once and thousands of people can listen. And then people is the last one. We're very much focused on people, but obviously they, they should all work together in a, in a good business. You've got all those factors working together, good people, creating good content, creating software and leveraging code and yeah. also deploying capital behind the business so but we're focused on the people side and then obviously businesses and our clients you know integrate those other parts or again we help them with the software and the tech and in the content sort of production and support side so just yeah. combining those four pieces of the puzzle in order to get the maximum yeah force multiplier effect yeah i find that stuff really interesting uh, alex mosey is another one that i've heard talk about that would you say that the four aspects of leverage do you think you should focus on one say you know you've got your code such as facebook or there's other social platforms or is it better to be a generalist as we discussed with and have a little bit of everything or do you think it just depends yeah it always goes back to what i'm changing if i say where do you want to be in 12 months from today you know some people they've started the business and their dream is to be a sole trader with a good income so yeah. they're not trying to scale. So if you're not really trying to scale, you probably don't need a heap of people. You don't even necessarily need a heap of capital or your people are yourself in your own time. Maybe you're a sole proprietor, trader, you know, consultant, advisor, freelancer. But if you want to build something bigger, at a certain point, you run out of hours in the day yeah. and then you have to use some leverage. And he also says content and code are permissionless leverage. You need someone else's capital. Usually the bank gives you money. Or, you know, you raise venture sort of funds. So capital, someone needs to sort of give it to you and people, people need to 
agree to sort of work for you. But the benefit is someone can start a podcast by themselves and leverage sort of content or, you know, post on social media or blog or, you know, record videos. And yeah, so software, there's a lot of freeware and ability. You can have an email list, you write one email and 10,000 people get it. So they're sort of freer and easier. Yeah. So they're probably more applicable to anyone, even a sole trader. But a bigger business at a certain point, you run out of hours, you run out of code and content. You say, well, I have to put people in, probably is the next step. And then when you're really growing, or if you're really ambitious or it's a very capital intensive business, like some pharmaceutical and research or property development, often you need investors, you need money, you need capital at a certain point. If you can't generate enough of your own internal capital through the business to sort of fund your growth. Yeah. So who would benefit most from leveraging labor to achieve their goals? Yeah, I'd say anyone who, who's in that phase where they're, they're small and they're starting out. Because if you've already got people, obviously, it's just, you know, you're already leveraging people to some extent, even if it's you and a part-time staff or three casual staff. So any business owner who already has staff is already leveraging people. So this is just another way to leverage people in the same way someone, you know, most businesses use some software, maybe it's zero or maybe it's, you know, Outlook, but they're always using some software. So, but anyone who doesn't yet have any people leverage, so it's all their own time, plus maybe some code and content, but who thinks I'm hitting a ceiling here. I need to be able to get some people on the team. I need some support. Doesn't always have to be full-time to start, but people who run into that bottleneck And they've got the ambition to grow because some people, they're maxed out. They say, yep, I've got a good self-employment, zero employee business. No worries. And they can reach a certain point. But people who want to grow beyond that, that's probably the best time to start thinking about people. Or if you've already got people, thinking, well, how else can I leverage people beyond what I'm currently doing? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And it's also something I want to bring up too is the 80-20 rule. I'm sure you've heard of that. Uh, You know, 20% of your effort produces 80% of your results. So if you're a business owner, it's often wise to focus on the 20% of income or revenue producing activities and outsource the rest of the 80%. Do you find that a common sort of occurrence when you're working with businesses? Yeah, and I often say to them, like when they say, who do I hire? I've got these different products. They say, well, what's the, the rate limiting factor? What's the bottleneck in your business? And they might say, well, again, I've got all this marketing content I'm producing, but I can't, I don't have the time to distribute it across the different social or to post produce it. So I've recorded 20 videos, podcast sessions, but I don't have the, the time to post produce. So the bottleneck is that production and distribution. They might have lots yeah. of guests, lots of content, lots of thought leadership, and they've got all that in their head. They're able to get it recorded, but they're not able to distribute it effectively. So that's where the best person would be someone to help with that distribution. Or for someone else, it could be a different bottleneck in their business. You know, like I said, they've grown beyond themselves. They've got a team, but their team are maxed out because they're having to do, let's say like a finance manager has to do the day-to-day, pay the bills and payroll and reconcile the transactions. But they're also trying to do cash flow and strategy management reports. For them, the thing stopping them from doing more reports and more forecasts, more high value activity is someone else to handle the transactional bookkeeping processing. And that's where that person would allow for a lot of leverage on that finance management. Yeah. And I guess with any outsourcing, really, it all comes down to understanding your hourly rate. Everyone can calculate the hourly rate. And it's the same if you hire a cleaner. If you earn $80 an hour and you come home and you're cleaning the house all weekend, you could use that time to work or freelance and earn an income, outsource that to someone else. Yeah, we all have the same amount of time. It's the only yeah. thing that's you know 100% equal. So the only difference are those four points of leverage. That's why someone can produce you know billions of dollars of wealth or value or impact and someone else can can really struggle. They've both got the same time, but some have massive teams behind them, massive capital behind them, massive code and software behind them or huge content distribution behind them. And that's sort of the difference. So moving back to a lot of the people that you've interviewed, is there any one form of leverage that you've found these high performers utilize? I would say the best businesses are using all four. There's no sort of escape. There's no like people are better than capital or capital is better than people. They in the interplay as well. Like if, if people help your business grow and you're able to raise capital, obviously the people drive over the capital. If someone invests money in your business or a bank gives you a loan, you can hire more people. So it's not like you move pebbles out of one jar or you put them into the other. The best businesses, and you can just see that anecdotally, like any of the, the sort of Fortune 100, they're leveraging all four factors fully. They've got the best people. They've got huge amounts of capital, whether it's internally generated or externally generated capital. They've got massive content, massive media, whether it's again, bought or earned or paid. And they've got massive sort of code. Every business has software. Even if they're not in the software business, they're leveraging software yeah. and tools yeah. or you know internal tools and or you know, often that increasing that they are a software business. So the biggest and best are using all four in to their fullest. And I guess as we move into the future with AI and everything, it's gonna become a massive massive part of businesses, right? Yeah, like internally in the business, actually, we're experimenting with different ways we can use AI, even, you know, video editing, post-producing videos, even just personally, I'm playing around with, you know, chat GPT to take plain 
text or English statements into Excel yeah. formulas. I'm, I'm not a coder, so I don't, I can't do, I know it can do more sophisticated stuff, but being able to write something in, in plain English and, and spit out a complex Excel formula, mm. um, even that is quite an interesting way, again, that human plus uh, code to work together and, you know, increasingly our clients as well are, are talking about how to leverage AI, machine learning, other tools to get more out of that code leverage. Yeah. And again, it's connected to the people. People use the code, code doesn't write itself and it's sort of, or leverage itself, it's it's sort of how do you put these two together and then obviously also feeding in the capital and, you know, the content production and that goes back to the automated video editing and auto transcription I've played around with a bit so yeah we're still just scratching the surface but watching it very closely yeah it it is really interesting we are just at the the start of it right it's interesting to think where this stuff will go but moving back to hiring virtual assistants offshore a lot of people when they hear about hiring or outsourcing from the Philippines it often comes with a sort of uh, stereotype of lower quality or lower cost I've spoken to you previously and I definitely know that's not the case but how do you go about hiring people and what's the reality yeah the reality is that like every industry is a full spectrum so a lot of the industry, so clients and service providers do chase the lowest cost, the cheapest. And when you chase the cheapest, you know, obviously some corners have been cut somewhere and often that's yeah. hiring very young, junior, inexperienced, poorly trained sort of people. And often, not to paint all big corporates, but sometimes big corporates are the most guilty of that. And that's when, you know, you call your telco, your bank, your, you know, a, a service provider, a utility, you have a bad, you know, customer service experience. Yeah, okay. Sometimes yeah. the person's in the Philippines, you think, oh, that's what the Philippines is like. We strategically don't do a lot of low-level tasks you know like I said there's plenty of clients wanting it we don't do a lot of yeah data entry really low-level contact center work because again often you need massive scale tens of thousands of staff to make that work so Mm. we've always been bespoke and higher value staff so recently putting on like quantity surveyors business yeah, analysts, yeah. software developers, financial analysts. I had someone today asking about, you know, financial modelling for investment banking. Yeah, wow. So there is a market for low-level talent. There's plenty of people you can find very cheaply with very little valuable skills, which yeah. we think is a false economy. But there's also, and what we've always, since Chris Moriarty began the business, have had a vision for sort of high-value professional talent and zigging when others zag. But I feel over time the industry has caught up as so much of the low-level stuff has been automated out anyway. But we've not seen that because we're not hiring low-level repetitive tasks and people. Yeah, yeah. And you get what you pay for too, I'm guessing. Yeah, and the industry, honestly, it's evolved in the 10 years I've been in it because there's 10 years of foreign companies employing, training, hiring, 10 years of technology, 10 years of standardization, 10 years of, you know, more people coming into the industry. So it employs about a million and a half people in the Philippines. It's a huge talent pool. Mm. You know, I was interviewing for a Google paid ads candidate recently, and there was someone who was running a million dollar a month budget for a US mortgage company, a paid Google ads. Wow. So Sometimes, like, just the scale, because, you know, Philippine services sort of the world. Like, even we run 24-7, so you've got APAC in the day, EMEA, UK, Europe, sort of in the, the mid-shift in America overnight. There are yeah. people with experience that you wouldn't even see in Australia often because, again, the scale of business in America and other things. So, or we've hired ex-Salesforce administrators that worked for Salesforce in mm. the Philippines, but yeah, they okay. were supporting Salesforce itself. Salesforce made various cutbacks and we were able to employ a bunch of excellent Salesforce analysts, administrators, data analysts. So there's talent which is, again, a lot beyond what you might think because of how the world's evolved in the last five or ten years. And it's there's always low junior people and, you know, that's where everyone starts. You, you and I would have started when we were grads not knowing how to do much, but there's also people with five, ten, fifteen years of really high-quality experience. That's who we focus on and yeah. who we mainly hire. Yeah, so I can definitely see the benefit of outsourcing. Your business is lean, but you're not hiring in-house. Yeah, so we're contracting with the client from their Australian entity to our Australian entity under Australian law. Yeah. And then we have another entity in the Philippines where we employ the staff. So staff get all the benefits of you know health insurance, salary, the ability to get a car loan or a home loan as you know, employees get. Yeah. But we're their employer of record. So we take the liability, you know, if there's some issue, mm-hmm. we're their employer from a you know compliance point of view. But from a practical point of view, they're a direct extension of the client's business. So you're right, the client doesn't have to manage superannuation, workers' comp, you you know, yeah. payroll tax, other complexities of, you know, HR and management, part of our service is to manage that for them. Because that's why, like, if you're running a business in Australia, I think, well, I want one person in New Zealand, one person in Singapore, one person in America, I'm going to have this great, one person in the Philippines, this great global team. The bottleneck is often, how do I employ and payroll all these people? Yeah. You know, with different jurisdictions, different labor laws, different taxes, different employer obligations. So that's often the bottleneck. And you can have five freelancers, obviously, in different countries, but pretty quickly you start, you know, bumping up into labor law complexities and we're able to provide that sort of plug and play solution because we've got hundreds of staff, got an in-house payroll, compliance, legal team. We can solve all that 
yeah. for them without the client having to think, how do I get an entity in an office? How do I buy a computer? What are the wage rates? What are the overtime rates? Oh, how does health insurance work? Oh, it's very different to Australia. So, so we skip all of those sort of compliance headaches that stop people often from, you know, sometimes even hiring into state in Australia is hard. Different payroll taxes, different insurances, different complexities different awards sometimes across roles if they're not standardised, different penalties for non-compliance in Victoria versus other states. So that often keeps people stuck in one legal jurisdiction, but we can say, no, actually we can, without adding any employer complexity, we can access millions of additional very skilled staff members. It does sound very complex. Was it difficult in the beginning to get your head around and navigate all this stuff? Yeah, so I'm very lucky. I didn't personally have to to go through any, but but Chris, my aunt again, the founder, when he, he packed up his life and sold his house and followed the story similar to many people on the, the podcast I mentioned where he and his wife, very supportive wife, moved over there to, to bet on themselves and mm. again, start the business. Um, he, yeah, had massive challenges and frustrations. The World Bank has a ranking on the ease of doing business um, okay. index and they look at contract law, employment law, labor law, all these different things. That, you know, Australia, America, Singapore, the ones you'd expect are all top 10. Yeah, very simple, clean, compliant, transparent countries for businesses to operate. The Philippines is normally not in the top 100, sometimes 140th, 130th. So, so, so it is a very difficult operating environment. Yeah. So you, what are the implications of that ranking? Um, again, the, there's no Australian outsourcing industry. If an American business wants to open up in Australia because they you know, have a, a clients in Australia, they can call an accountant and a lawyer, register an entity, lease an office, call a recruiter, hire staff, there is no industry to do that. You just get an entity, you do it yourself because it is very simple. The same as if an Australian company went to America. That There is no American you know, outsourcing middleman sort of industry because you just register a company, get an accountant, get an office, get some staff. You might have some consultants to help you set it up, but you wouldn't need to use someone else's entity. You wouldn't need to do all that. So in an interesting way, that complexity is what sort of requires Again, um, a company like Flat Planet to help you, to guide you, to employ it. Because if you tried to go there and set up an entity, do it all yourself, there'd be so many traps or mistakes or things that you could easily run afoul of. That's why you could do it in New Zealand, but you wouldn't do it sort of there. And that's sort of why the industry exists to allow sort of safe passage and have on the ground support and access to people who are very good. But if there wasn't people to help with that and connect across the two regions, again, those very same barriers to doing business would prevent people from connecting with great team members. In regards to the team members themselves, how do you go about sourcing and hiring talent? Yeah, so we take a real people first approach. We don't make people fill in big applicant tracking system software or answer 200 questions or retype their resume. All we really need is their CV and their contact info. Yep. Our in-house recruitment team will then call them up, have a chat, ask about what are they doing, what do they want in the next role, what roles do we have that might fit, and then if there seems to be you know, a fit for our roles, we'll pass them through the next stage. I'll often chat to, to staff before putting them in front of my clients and sort of again sussing all the background stuff distance to the office salary expectations reason for leaving all that stuff is already pre-done so by the time we endorse them to the client who has a final decision and interview all the basics are done and it's the client saying would this person match what i need because they know their business obviously better than anyone and does the person fit into what they're looking for for some there's a portfolio there's a skills assessment something like that that might be needed but we try and turn all of those steps around within seven days as well to respect the candidate's time to not lose people to other offers because we drag it out. So we try and make it simple to apply, very human. You know, it's, you're not all autoresponder emails. We're talking to people. Mm. We do the leg work for the clients and the applicant usually within a week or two knows whether or not they're successful or unsuccessful. They're not stuck in purgatory for months. Do you have a question about investing that you'd like answered? Each month, we take questions from our listeners and put them to our resident expert, Luke Harris. With more than two decades of residential and commercial investment experience under his belt, Luke has seen the best and the worst of the property market. Have a burning question you want answered on an upcoming episode? Visit investorintelligence.com.au forward slash questions and ask us today. Do you hire for a client that you work with or do you have a roster that you've got ready? Generally, we're custom hiring and that's why we can do such the broad range of roles I've mentioned, like from finance to quantity surveying to IT to customer support and sales support yeah. and, and digital marketing because we're custom hiring. So we do all the legwork, the screening, the outreach, the seeing who's qualified, who's not, the, the shortlisting, but the client has a final interview. But we are doing a essentially like an executive search, not just yeah, pulling someone off a bench and 
allocating them to a client. We're generally yeah. custom hiring a, a full-time dedicated person just for them, for their exact needs. Yeah, okay. Well, my next question was actually going to be what are the qualities and skills that you look for when hiring talent, but it sounds like it comes back to the client and what their needs are. Yeah, and, and we guide them as well because sometimes, again, people might be used to, say, hiring a lot of grads in Australia. They're a small yeah. business, they're growing, they, you know, they, they work with a whole range of different people. So part of our role is to say, hey, here's why that same model, like I said, hiring a, a cheap grad isn't probably the right fit in the Philippines. And you know, there's different reasons. Um, I won't sort of bore you with it, but it's quite different. So we'll sort of pre-filter and say, hey, for this role, you know, we want someone with a university degree, three to five years work experience. Ideally, they've worked for a foreign company before because, again, you know, a lot of Filipino companies operate differently to Australian yeah. companies or Western companies. And we're sort of pre-filtering and behavioral fit and other sort of work history, background, communication skills. So by the time the client chats to them, they're not sort of making the wrong decision, but we're shortlisting and then listening to their feedback, more of this, less of that. So they have the final decision, but we're taking care of things we know. If we get the right person, we know it's going to work. Yeah. If you get the wrong person, you try and manage them this, policy, procedure them to death, process them to death. I find even in Australia, that never works. It's really getting the right people. So we front load all that work to get the right people. And then 95% 95% of it smooth sailing after that because you've got the right person, the right seat for the right client, not the wrong person you're trying to fix it. Yeah, yeah. In regards to actually assessing their skills, obviously you can look at their resume, what they've done, their experience and any degrees they have. But in regards to the actual soft skills such as creative thinking, problem solving, how do you go about assessing that? Yeah, like I said, especially if I'm screening candidates I'll often ask questions and open-ended questions. Some people are used to interviewing like a checklist. Have you done this? Yep. Have you got experience with this? Yep. Well, anyone can yes, yes. And culturally, again, a lot of people in the Philippines are more inclined to sort of say yes and sort of agree with the person interviewing them. But asking an open-ended question, how would you go about this? What's your process for that? Yeah. When's the time you have encounter this how did you solve it yeah so there's the way of questioning can help um we'll often sit in on the client interviews as well to you know get a better sense of what the client wants but also to maybe guide them or provide some extra questions they might not have thought of that might be you know cultural subtleties but yeah and then we often do encourage a technical assessment like for data analysts we were hiring recently we had sample dummy data and they had to produce dashboards and show that they could understand the data present the data because that's what the role would be mm. interpreting big data sets putting into dashboards and then presenting that data to non-technical people. So we created a, you know, a reasonable 20, 30 minute exercise, but then that filters for people who, it doesn't matter that all the data is perfect. What matters is, can they research it? Can they present well? Can they analyze things they haven't seen before? Can they ask good questions? Can they sort of think their way through the problem? But you're right, it is a bit of a skill that our recruiters and we sort of often use to make sure you're not just getting someone who looks good on paper, but may not actually have the skills and is less likely to work out long term. Yeah, that's right. And I guess anyone can put on their resume that they're good at communication or creative, but if you don't have those means to find out, then how do you really know? Yeah, and even customer service roles, like I said, we don't do the low-level customer service. We work with some brands with very high-quality customer service teams and, you know, we'll do role plays. So, you know, in in a real role play, how do you deal with a question you don't know the answer to? Because that will come up, you know, even if you've been in a job for six months in customer service, you're not going to know every answer. So when you don't know the answer, do you freeze, do you panic, do you say the wrong answer or do you have a good way of managing that? Or, Or what do you do with an irate customer? So you might say, you know, I didn't get my package. And then, well, okay, what do you say? How do you respond to that? And again, skilled customer service people who aren't 18-year-olds working in a big corporate but have been in five years, they know how to de-escalate, how to calm things down, how to reassure people. And that's really what you're hiring for, that sort of empathy and in a role like that, people Mm. skills or in a technical role, it's sort of technical expertise and logical thinking. Yeah, well, fantastic, Derek. I have two final questions for you. First one, what's your favourite book? There's a classic I really like called The Magic of Thinking Big by Dr. David Schwartz. It's sort of a self-improvement book from the 1950s. All the the dollar figures are are very dated, but timeless classic in mindset, goals, vision, belief, attitude. That's a very easy read. Highly recommend it. I reread it every year or two. A more practical recent book is Undisruptible by Ian Whitworth. So he's an Aussie entrepreneur, wrote a book, has a great blog about just common sense, practical entrepreneurial business topics. Again, he wrote it a year or two ago, so very recent with a lot of, you know, COVID jokes and sort of insights because he ran a live events business. Business. So again, massively shut down to basically zero mm. during COVID, he had to reinvent the business and he's just, you know, a sharp operator from what I can tell. I haven't met him, but his book, if you want some sort of very practical business wisdom from a, you know, an Australian entrepreneur, that's a book I, I'm recommending to a lot of people lately. And a final question, what are you excited about for the future? Yeah, I think it's a lot of the themes we've, we've been talking about. It's the idea that, you know, a sole trader or a small business can be what some call a micro multinational. So multinational people think 10,000 staff, giant global business, 
You can be a five person business with five people in five different countries or continents, or even within Australia, you might be a two person marketing team. But now with the things I mentioned, like the leverage of you know podcasts, videos, social media, email lists, other distribution, a two person marketing team, and I've seen it before, could outperform a 30 person marketing team who are in their own way or taking too long. There's yeah. again, tools like Canva, these AI editing tools. So the leverage that's available, yeah. I think through tech and content is incredible. And the opportunities for a small or, you know, what traditionally what you think a small or a medium sized business to massively, you know, compete with larger businesses or access international markets has never been what it is. So that's what sort of keeps me optimistic and excited in a, you know, an otherwise sometimes crazy world mm. is these opportunities if you've got the right belief and the attitude and the tools are there to do things which, you know, five, 10, 20 years ago, again, broadcasting, recording video, building an audience of, of tens of thousands was so much harder yeah. and out of reach for a small business. So it really was capital that determined the winners. But now there's these other points of leverage, which weren't really accessible as much before to even small operators. And besides working with someone such as yourself, how would you recommend people going about getting in front of these technologies? Um, you know, I'm not a, a technology sort of specialist or expert myself, but for a lot, I'd say, you know, have a go. A lot of them have free trials, like, you know, whether it's a chat GPT or even, you know, there are a lot of small businesses that don't have a CRM set up. They don't have an email list. They don't have a zero or my sort of bookkeeping platform, but chat to people, learn what's out there, you know, have a play with some of them. You'd be amazed at what's possible with a lot of different tools. See, depending on the type of business, I'm a big LinkedIn fan, but recently mm. been experimenting more with TikTok. Sometimes you've sort of got to get in there and, and play with it and see what's possible. And over time, you scale you're going to delegate that more or but chat to people who are doing it who are yeah. experts and but play around with it yourself and don't be afraid to yeah have a go and learn and, and get a new perspective that um you might not have thanks for your time derek we'll include uh links to everything you've mentioned your podcast and where they can find out more about you and flat planet thanks for your time it's been great thanks so much for having me on jacob if you found this episode or any of our episodes helpful please make sure to share and leave a rating to help us reach more people on their investing journeys. And of course, subscribe to be notified when new episodes drop. Make sure to follow the podcast on Instagram at Investor Intelligence Podcast. You can find links to our other socials in the show notes, including a link to the Property Mentors weekly blog. If you're ready to get your property portfolio in shape for financial freedom, check out Luke's latest book, Property Fit. You can get yourself a copy at www.propertyfitbook.com dot com dot au